I used to have at times, as I have said, though it used to pass quickly away, certain commencements of that which I am going now to describe. When I formed those pictures within myself of throwing myself at the feet of Christ, as I said before, and sometimes even when I was reading, a feeling of the presence of God would overcome me unexpectedly, so that I could in no wise doubt either that he was within me or that I was wholly absorbed in him. It was not by way of vision. I believe it was what is called mystical theology. The soul is suspended in such a way that it seems to be utterly beside itself. The will loves. The memory, so it seems to me, is as it were lost. And the understanding, so I think, makes no reflections. Yet it's not lost. As I have just said, it is not at work, but it stands as if amazed at the greatness of the things it understands. For God wills it to understand what it understands understands nothing, whatever, of that which his majesty places before it. Before this, I had a certain tenderness of soul which was very abiding, partially attainable, I believe, in some measure, by our own efforts. A consolation which is not holy in the senses, nor yet altogether in the spirit, but is all of it the gift of God. However, I think we can contribute much towards the attaining of it by considering our vileness and our ingratitude towards God, the great things he has done for us, his passion with its grievous pains, and his life so full of sorrows. Also, by rejoicing in the contemplation of his works, of his greatness, and of the love that he bears us. Many other considerations there are which he who really desires to make progress will often stumble on, though he may not be very much on the watch for them. If with this there be a little love, the soul is comforted, the heart is softened, and tears flow. Sometimes it seems as though we do violence to ourselves and weep. At other times, our Lord seems to do so, so that we have no power to resist him. His majesty seems to reward this slight carefulness of ours with so grand a gift as is this consolation, which he ministers to the soul of seeing itself weeping for so great a Lord. I am not surprised, for the soul has reason enough, and more than enough, for its joy. Here it comforts itself. Here it rejoices. The comparison which now presents itself seems to me to be good. These joys in prayer are like what those of heaven must be, as the vision of the saints, which is measured by their merits there, reaches no further than our Lord wills, and as the blessed see how little merit they had, every one of them is satisfied with the place assigned him, there being the very greatest difference between one joy and another in heaven and much greater than between one spiritual joy and another on earth, which is, however, very great. And in truth, in the beginning, a soul in which God works this grace thinks now it has scarcely anything more to desire and counts itself abundantly rewarded for all the service it has rendered him. And there is a reason for this, for one of those tears, which, as I have just said, are almost in our own power, though without God nothing can be done, cannot, in my opinion, be purchased with all the labors of the world because of the great gain it brings us. And what greater gain can we have than some testimony of our having pleased God? Let him, then, who shall have attained to this, give praise unto God, acknowledge himself to be one of his greatest debtors, because it seems to be his will to take him into his house, having chosen him for his kingdom, if he does not turn back. Let him not regard certain kinds of humility, which exist, and of which I mean to speak. Some think it humility not to believe that God is bestowing his gifts upon them. Let us clearly understand this, and that it is perfectly clear God bestows his gifts without any merit whatever on our part and let us be grateful to his majesty for them. For if we do not recognize the gifts received at his hands, we shall never be moved to love him. 
it is a most certain truth that the richer we see ourselves to be, confessing at the same time our poverty, the greater will be our progress and the more real our humility. An opposite course tends to take away all courage, for we shall think ourselves incapable of great blessings if we begin to frighten ourselves with the dread of vainglory when our Lord begins to show his mercy upon us. Let us believe that he who gives these gifts will also, when the devil begins to tempt us herein, give us the grace to detect him and the strength to resist him. That is, he will do so if we walk in simplicity before God, aiming at pleasing him only, and not men. It is most evident truth that our love for a person is greater the more distinctly we remember the good he has done us. If, then, it is lawful and so meritorious always to remember that we have our being from God, that he has created us out of nothing, that he preserves us, and also to remember all the benefits of his death and passion, which he suffered long before he made us for every one of us now alive, why should it not be lawful for me to discern, confess, and consider often that I was once accustomed to speak of vanities? and that now our Lord has given me the grace to speak only of himself. Here, then, is a precious pearl, which when we remember that it is given us and that we have it in possession, powerfully invites us to love. All this is the fruit of prayer founded on humility. What, then, will it be when we shall find ourselves in possession of other pearls of greater price, such as contempt of the world and of self, which some servants of God have already received. It is clear that such souls must consider themselves great debtors, under greater obligations to serve him. We must acknowledge that we have nothing of ourselves and confess the munificence of our Lord, who, on a soul so wretched and poor and so utterly undeserving as mine is, for whom the first of these pearls was enough, and more than enough, would bestow greater riches than I could desire. We must renew our strength to serve him, and strive not to be ungrateful, because it is on this condition that our Lord dispenses his treasures. For if we do not make good use of them, and of the high estate to which he raises us, he will return and take them from us and we shall be poorer than ever. His Majesty will give the pearls to him who shall bring them forth and employ them usefully for himself and others. For how shall he be useful, and how shall he spend liberally, who does not know that he is rich? It is not possible, I think, our nature being what it is, that he can have the courage necessary for great things who does not know that God is on his side. For so miserable are we, so inclined to the things of this world, that he can hardly have any real abhorrence of, with great detachment from, all earthly things who does not see that he holds some pledges for those things that are above. It is by these gifts that our Lord gives us that strength which we, through our sins, have lost." A man will hardly wish to be held in contempt and abhorrence, nor will he seek after the great virtues to which the perfect attain, if he has not some pledges of the love which God bears him, together with a living faith. Our nature is so dead that we go after that which we see immediately before us. And it is these graces, therefore, that quicken and strengthen our faith. It may well be that I, who am so wicked, measure others by myself, and that others require nothing more than the verities of the faith in order to render their works most perfect. While I, wretched that I am, have need of everything. Others will explain this. I speak from my own experience, as I have been commanded, and if what I say be not correct, Let him to whom I send it destroy it, for he knows better than I do what is wrong in it. 
I entreat him for the love of our Lord to publish abroad what I have thus far said of my wretched life and of my sins. I give him leave to do so, and to tell all my confessors also, of whom he is one, to whom this is to be sent, if it be their pleasure, even during my life, so that I may no longer deceive people who think there must be some good in me. Certainly, I speak in all sincerity. So far as I understand myself, such publication will give me great comfort. But as to that which I am now going to say, I give no such leave, nor, if it be shown to anyone, do I consent to its being said who the person is whose experience it describes, nor who wrote it. This is why I mention neither my own name nor that of any other person whatever. I have written it in the best way I could in order not to be known, and this I beg of them for the love of God. Persons so learned and grave as they are have authority enough to approve whatever right things I may say, should our Lord give me the grace to do so. And if I should say anything of the kind, it will be his and not mine. Because I am neither learned nor of good life. I have no person of learning or any other to teach me. For they only who ordered me to write know that I am writing. And at this moment, they are not here. I have, as it were, to steal the time, and that with difficulty, because my writing hinders me from spinning. I'm living in a house that is poor, and have many things to do. If, indeed, our Lord had given me greater abilities and a better memory, I might then profit by what I have seen and read. But my abilities are very slight. If, then, I should say anything that is right our Lord will have it said for some good purpose. That which may be wrong will be mine, and your reverence will strike it out. In neither case will it be of any use to publish my name. During my life it is clear that no good I may have done ought to be told. After death there is no reason against it except that it will lose all authority and credit because related of a person so vile and so wicked as I am. And because I think your reverence and the others who may see this writing will do this that I ask of you. For the love of our Lord, I write with freedom. If it were not so, I should have great scruples, except in declaring my sins, and in that matter, I should have none at all. For the rest, it is enough that I am a woman to make my sails droop. How much more then? when I am a woman, and am a wicked one. Since then, everything here beyond the simple story of my life, your reverence must take upon yourself, since you have so pressed me to give some account of the graces which our Lord bestowed upon me in prayer, if it is consistent with the truths of our holy Catholic faith. If it be not, your reverence must burn it at once, for I give my consent. I will recount my experience in order that, if it be consistent with those truths, your reverence may make use of it. If not, you will deliver my soul from delusion, so that Satan may gain nothing there where I seem to be gaining myself. Our Lord knows well that I, as I shall show hereafter, have always labored to find out those who could give me light. How clear soever I may wish to make my account of that which relates to prayer, it will be obscure enough for those who are without experience. I shall speak of certain hindrances which, as I understand it, keep men from advancing on this road, and of other things which are dangerous, as our Lord has taught me by experience. I have also discussed the matter with men of great learning, with persons who for many years have lived spiritual lives, who admit that, in the twenty-seven years only during which I have given myself to prayer, though I walked so ill and stumbled often on the road. His Majesty granted me that experience which others attained to in seventy and thirty, and seventy and forty years. And they too, being persons 
ever advanced in the way of penance and of virtue. Blessed be God for all, and may his infinite majesty make use of me. Our Lord knoweth well that I have no other end in this than that he may be praised and magnified a little when men shall see that on a dunghill so foul and rank he has made a garden of flowers so sweet. May it please his majesty that I may not by my own fault root them out and become again what I was before. And I entreat your reverence for the love of our Lord to beg this of him for me, seeing that you have a clearer knowledge of what I am than you have allowed me to give of myself here. I speak now of those who begin to be the servants of love. That seems to me to be nothing else but to resolve to follow him in the way of prayer who has loved us so much. It is a dignity so great that I have a strange joy in thinking of it, for servile fear vanishes at once if we, as we ought to be, in the first degree. O Lord of my soul and my good, how is it that when a soul is determined to love thee, doing all it can by forsaking all things in order that it may the better occupy itself with love of God, is it not thy will it should have the joy of ascending at once to the possession of perfect love? I have spoken amiss. I ought to have said, and my complaint should have been, why is it we do not? For the fault is wholly our own that we do not rejoice at once in a dignity so great, seeing that the attaining to the perfect possession of this true love brings all blessings with it. We think so much of ourselves, and are so dilatory in giving ourselves wholly to God that His Majesty will not let us have the fruition of that which is so precious, but at a great cost. So neither do we perfectly prepare ourselves for it. I see plainly that there is nothing by which so great a good can be procured in this world. If, however, we do what we could, not clinging to anything upon earth, but having all our thoughts and conversation in heaven, I believe that this blessing would quickly be given us, provided we perfectly prepared ourselves for it at once, as some of the saints have done. We think we are giving all to God, but, in fact, we are offering only the revenue or the produce, while we retain the fee simple of the land in our own possession. We resolve to become poor, and it is a resolution of great merit. But we very often take great care not to be in want, not simply of what is necessary, but what is superfluous. Yea, and to make for ourselves friends who may supply us. And in this way we take more pains, and perhaps expose ourselves to greater danger in order that we may want nothing than we did formerly when we had our own possessions and our own power. We thought also that we gave up all desire of honor when we became religious, or when we began the spiritual life and followed after perfection. And yet, when we are touched on the point of honor, we do not remember that we had given it up to God. We would seize it again and take it, as they say, out of his hands even after we had made him, to all appearance, the Lord of our own will. So is it in everything else. A pleasant way, this of seeking the love of God. We retain our own affections, and yet, while we have that love, as they say, by handfuls. We make no efforts to bring our desires to good effect, or to raise them resolutely above the earth, And yet, with all this, we must have many spiritual consolations. This is not well, and we are seeking things that are incompatible with one another. So, because we do not give ourselves up wholly and at once, this treasure is not given wholly and at once to us. May it be the good pleasure of our Lord to give it us drop by drop, 
though it may cost us all the trials in the world. He showeth great mercy unto him to whom he gives the grace and resolution to strive for this blessing with all his might, for God withholds himself from no one who perseveres. He will, by little and little, strengthen that soul, so that it may come forth victorious. I say resolution because of the multitude of those things which Satan puts before it at first to keep it back from beginning to travel on this road. For he knoweth what harm will befall him thereby. He will lose not only that soul, but many others also. If he who enters on this road does violence to himself with the help of God so as to reach the summit of perfection, such a one, I believe, will never go alone to heaven. He will always take many with him. God gives to him, as to a good captain, those who shall be of his company. Thus, then, the dangers and difficulties which Satan puts before them are so many that they have need not of little, but of a very great resolution and a great grace from God to save them from falling away. Speaking, then, of their beginnings who are determined to follow after this good and to succeed in their enterprise, what I began to say of mystical theology, I believe they call it by that name, I shall proceed with hereafter. I have to say that the labor is greatest at first, for it is they who toil, our Lord indeed giving them strength. In the other degrees of prayer there is more fruition, although they who are in the beginning, the middle, and the end have their crosses to carry. The crosses, however, are different. They who would follow Christ, if they do not wish to be lost, must walk in the way he walked himself. Blessed labors, even here in this life, so supra-abundantly rewarded. I shall have to make use of a comparison. I should like to avoid it because I am a woman and write simply what I have been commanded. But this language of spirituality is so difficult of utterance for those who are not learned, and such am I. I have, therefore, to seek for some means to make the matter plain. It may be that the comparison will very rarely be to the purpose. Your reverence will be amused when you see my stupidity. I think now I have either read or heard of this comparison, but as my memory is bad, I know not where, nor on what occasion. However, I am satisfied with it for my present purpose. A beginner must look upon himself as making a garden, wherein our Lord may take his delight, but in a soil unfruitful and abounding in weeds. His Majesty roots up the weeds and has to plant good herbs. Let us then take for granted that this is already done when a soil is determined to give itself to prayer and has begun the practice of it. We have then, as good gardeners, by the help of God, to see that the plants grow, to water them carefully, that they may not die, but produce blossoms, which will send forth much fragrance, refreshing to our Lord, so that he may come often for his pleasure into this garden and delight himself in the midst of these virtues. Let us now see how this garden is to be watered, that we may understand what we have to do, how much trouble it will cost us, whether the gain be greater than the trouble, or how long a time it will take us. It seems to me that the garden may be watered in four ways. By water taken out of a well, which is very laborious, or with water raised by means of an engine and buckets drawn by a windlass. I have drawn it this way sometimes. It is a less troublesome way than the first and gives more water. Or by a stream or a brook whereby the garden is watered in a much better way. For the soil is more thoroughly saturated and there is no necessity to water it so often and the labor of the gardener is much less. Or by showers of rain when our Lord himself waters it without labor on our part 
and this way is incomparably better than all the others of which I have spoken. Now then, for the application of these four ways of irrigation by which the garden is to be maintained, for without water it must fail. The comparison is to my purpose, and it seems to me that by the help of it I shall be able to explain in some measure the four degrees of prayer to which our Lord, of his goodness, has occasionally raised my soul. May he graciously grant that I may speak as to be of some service to one of those who has commanded me to write, whom our Lord has raised in four months to a greater height than I have reached in seventeen years. He prepared himself better than I did, and therefore is his garden without labor on his part, irrigated by those four waters, though the last of them is only drop by drop. But it is growing in such a way that soon, by the help of our Lord, he will be swallowed up therein, and it will be a pleasure to me, if he finds my explanation absurd, that he should laugh at it. Of those who are beginners in prayer, we may say that they are those who draw the water up out of the well, a process which, as I have said, is very laborious, for they must be wearied in keeping the senses recollected. And this is a great labor, because the senses have been hitherto accustomed to distractions. It is necessary for beginners to accustom themselves to disregard what they hear or see, and to put it away from them during the time of prayer. They must be alone, and in retirement think over their past life. Though all must do this many times, beginners as well as those more advanced, all, however, must not do so equally, as I shall show hereafter. Beginners at first suffer much, because they are not convinced that they are penitent for their sins, And yet they are, because they are so sincerely resolved on serving God. They must strive to meditate on the life of Christ, and the understanding is wearied thereby. Thus far we can advance of ourselves, that is, by the grace of God. For without that, as everyone knows, we never can have one good thought. This is the beginning to draw water up out of the well. God grant that there may be water in it, That, however, does not depend on us. We are drawing it and doing what we can towards watering the flowers. So good is God that when, for reasons known to his majesty, perhaps for our greater good, it is his will that the well should be dry. He himself preserves the flowers without water. We, like good gardeners, doing what lies in our power and makes our virtues grow. By water... Here I mean tears, and if there be none, then tenderness and inward feeling of devotion. What then will he do here who sees that for many days he is conscious only of aridity, disgust, dislike, and so great an unwillingness to go to the well for water that he would give it up altogether if he did not remember that he has to please and serve the Lord of the garden? If he did not trust that his service was not in vain and did not hope for some gain by labor so great as that by lowering the bucket into the well so often and drawing it up without water in it. It will happen that he is often unable to move his arms for that purpose or to have one good thought working with the understanding as drawing water out of the well. What then once more will the gardener do now? He must rejoice and take comfort and consider it as the greatest favor to labor in the garden of so great an emperor. And as he knows that he is pleasing the Lord in that matter, and his purpose must not be to please himself but the Lord, let him praise the Lord greatly for the trust the Lord has in him. For the Lord sees that without any recompense, He is taking so much care of that which has been confided to him. Let him help the Lord to carry the cross, and to let him think that the Lord carried it all the Lord's life long. Let him not seek his kingdom here, nor ever intermit his prayer, and so let him resolve, 
if this aridity should last even his whole life long, never to let Christ fall down beneath the cross. The time will come when he shall be paid once for all. Let him have no fear that his labor is in vain. He serves a good master whose eyes are upon him. Let him make no account of evil thoughts, but remember that Satan suggested them to St. Jerome also in the desert. These labors have their reward, I know it, for I am one who underwent them for many years. When I drew but one drop of water out of this blessed well, I considered it was a mercy of God. I know these labors are very great and require, I think, greater courage than many others in this world. But I have seen clearly that God does not leave them without a greater recompense, even in this life. For it is very certain that in one hour during which our Lord gave me to taste his sweetness, All the anxieties which I had to bear when persevering in prayer seemed to me ever afterwards perfectly rewarded. I believe that it is our Lord's good pleasure frequently in the beginning and at times in the end to send these torments and many other incidental temptations to try those who love him and to ascertain if they will drink the chalice and help him to carry the cross before he entrusts them with his great treasures. I believe it to be for our good that his majesty should lead us by this way, so that we may perfectly understand how worthless we are, for the graces which he gives afterwards are of a dignity so great that he will have us by experience know our wretchedness before he grants them, that it may not be with us as it was with Lucifer. What canst thou do, O my Lord, that is not for the greater good of that soul which thou knowest to be already thine, and which gives itself up to thee to follow thee whithersoever thou goest, even to the death of the cross, and which is determined to help thee to carry that cross and to leave thee alone with it? He who shall discern this resolution in himself has nothing to fear No, no, spiritual people have nothing to fear. There is no reason why he should be distressed who is already raised to so high a degree as this of wishing to converse in solitude with God and to abandon the amusements of the world. The greater part of the work is done. Give praise to his majesty for it and trust in his goodness who has never failed those who love him. Close the eyes of your imagination, and do not ask why he gives devotion to this person in so short a time, and none to me after so many years. Let us believe that all is for our greater good. Let his majesty guide us whithersoever he will. We are not our own, but his. He shows us mercy enough when it is his pleasure we should be willing to dig in his garden and to be so near the Lord of it. He certainly is near to us. If it be his will that these plants and flowers should grow, some of them when he gives water we may draw from the well, others when he gives none. What is that to me? Do thou, O Lord, accomplish Thy will. Let me never offend thee, nor let my virtues perish. If thou hast given me any, it is out of thy mere goodness. I wish to suffer, because thou, O Lord, hast suffered. Do thou in every way fulfill thy will in me, and may it never be the pleasure of thy majesty that a gift so high a price as that of thy love be given to people who serve thee only because of the sweetness they find thereby. It is as much to be observed, and I say so because I know by experience, that the soul which begins to walk in the way of mental prayer with resolution and is determined not to care much, neither to rejoice nor to be greatly afflicted 
whether sweetness and tenderness fail it, or our Lord grants them, has already travailed a great part of the road. Let that soul, then, have no fear that it is going back, though it may frequently stumble, for the building has begun on a firm foundation. It is certain that the love of God does not consist in tears, nor in the sweetness and tenderness which we, for the most part, desire, and with which we console ourselves, but rather in serving Him in justice, fortitude, and humility. That seems to me to be a receiving rather than a giving of anything on our part. As for poor women, such as I am, weak and infirm of purpose, it seems to me to be necessary that I should be led on through consolations, as God is doing now, so that I might be able to endure certain afflictions which it has pleased His Majesty I should have. But when the servants of God, who are men of weight, learning, and sense, make so much as I see they do, whether God gives them sweetness and devotion or not, I am disgusted when I listen to them. I do not say that they ought not to accept it and make much of it when God gives it, because when he gives it, his majesty sees to it to be necessary for them. But I do say that they ought not to grow weary when they have it not. They should then understand that they have no need of it, and be masters of themselves when his majesty does not give it. Let them be convinced of this. There is a fault here. I have had an experience of it, and I know it to be so. Let them believe that it is an imperfection. They are not advancing in liberty of spirit, but shrinking like cowards from the assault. It is not so much to beginners that I say this, though I do insist upon it because it is of great importance to them that they should begin with this liberty and resolution. As to others, of whom there are many, who make a beginning but never come to the end, and that is owing, I believe, in great measure, to their not having embraced the cross from the first. They are distressed, thinking they are doing nothing. The understanding ceases from its acts, and they cannot bear it. Yet, perhaps at that very time the will is feeding and gathering strength, and they know it not. We must suppose that our Lord does not regard these things, for though they seem to us to be faults, yet they are not. His Majesty knoweth our misery and natural vileness better than we do ourselves. He knoweth that these souls long to be always thinking of Him and loving Him. It is this resolution that he seeks in us. The other anxieties we afflict upon ourselves serve to no other end but to disquiet the soul, which, if it be unable to derive any profit in one hour, will by them be disabled for four. This comes most frequently from bodily indisposition. I have had a very great experience in this matter, and I know it is true for I have carefully observed it and discussed it afterwards with spiritual persons. For we are so wretched that this poor prisoner of a soul shares in the miseries of the body, the changes of the seasons, and the alterations of the humors very often compel it, without fault of its own, not to do what it would, but rather to suffer in every way. Meanwhile, the more we force the soul on these occasions, the greater mischief and the longer it lasts. Some discretion must be used in order to ascertain whether ill health be the occasion or not. The poor soul must not be stifled. Let those who thus suffer understand that they are ill. A change should be made in the hour of prayer, and oftentimes that change should be continued for some days. Let souls pass out of this desert as they can, for it is very often the misery of one that loves God to see itself living in such wretchedness, unable to do what it would, because it has to keep so evil a guest as the body. I spoke of discretion, because sometimes the devil will do the same work, and so it is not always right to omit prayer when the understanding is greatly distracted and disturbed, 
nor to torment the soul to the doing of that which is out of its power. There are other things then to be done, exterior works, as of charity and spiritual reading, though at times the soul will not be able to do them. Take care then of the body for the love of God, because at many other times the body must serve the soul, and let recourse be had to some recreations, holy ones, such as conversation or going out into the fields, as the confessor shall advise. Altogether, experience is a great matter, and it makes us understand what is convenient for us. Let God be served in all things. His yoke is sweet, and it is of great importance that the soul should not be dragged, as they say, but carried gently, that it may make great progress. So then, I come back to what I advised before, and though I repeat it often, it matters not. It is of great importance that no one should distress himself on account of aridities, or because his thoughts are restless and distracted. Neither should he be afflicted thereat if he would attain to liberty of spirit and not be always in trouble. Let him begin by not being afraid of the cross, and he will see how our Lord will help him to carry it, how joyfully he will advance, and what profit he will derive from it all. It is now clear, if there is no water in the well, that we at least can put none into it. It is true we must not be careless about drawing it when there is any in it, because at that time it is the will of God to multiply our virtues by means thereof. My aim in the foregoing chapter though I digress to many other matters because they seemed very necessary, was to explain how much we may attain to of ourselves and how, in these beginnings of devotion, we are able in some degree to help ourselves because thinking of and pondering on the sufferings of our Lord for our sakes moves us to compassion and the sorrow and tears which result therefrom are sweet. The thought of the blessedness we hope for, the love our Lord bore us, and of his resurrection, kindle within us a joy which is neither wholly spiritual nor wholly sensual. But the joy is virtuous, and the sorrow is most meritorious. Of this kind are all those things which produce a devotion acquired in part by means of the understanding. Though it can neither be merited nor had if God grants it not. It is best for a soul which God has not raised to a higher state than this not to try to rise of itself. Let this be well considered, because all the soul will gain in that way will be a loss. In this state, it can make many acts of good resolutions to do much for God and enkindle its love. Other acts also, which may help the growth of virtues, according to that which is written in a book called The Art of Serving God, a most excellent work, and profitable for those who are in this state, because the understanding is active now. The soul may also place itself in the presence of Christ and accustom itself to many acts of love directed to his sacred humanity and remain in his presence continually, and speak to him, pray to him in its necessities, and complain to him of its troubles. Be merry with him in its joys, and yet not forget him because of its joys. All this it may do without set prayers, but rather with words befitting its desires and needs. This is an excellent way whereby to advance, and that very quickly. He that will strive to have this precious companionship and will make much of it and will sincerely love our Lord, to whom we owe so much, in my opinion, who has made some progress. There is therefore no reason why we should trouble ourselves because we have no sensible devotion, as I said before. But let us rather give thanks to our Lord who allows us to have a desire to please him 
though our works be poor. This practice of the presence of Christ is profitable in all states of prayer and is a most safe way of advancing in the first state and of attaining quickly to the second. And as for the last states, it secures us against those risks which the devil may occasion. This, then, is what we can do. He who would pass out of this state and upraise his spirit in order to taste consolations denied him will, in my opinion, lose both the one and the other. These consolations being supernatural and the understanding inactive, the soul is then left desolate and in great aridity. As the foundation of the whole building is humility, the nearer we draw unto God, the more this virtue should grow. If it does not, everything is lost. It seems to me to be a kind of pride when we seek to ascend higher, seeing that God descends so low, when he allows us, being what we are, to draw near unto him. It must not be supposed that I am now speaking of raising our thoughts to the consideration of the high things of heaven and of its glory, or unto God and his great wisdom. I never did this myself, because I had not the capacity for it, as I said before. And I was so worthless that as to thinking even of the things of earth, God gave me grace to understand this truth, that in me it was not slight boldness to do so. How much more than thinking of heavenly things? Others, however, will profit in that way, particularly those who are learned. For learning, in my opinion, is a great treasury in the matter of this exercise, if it be accompanied with humility. I observed this a few days ago in some learned men who had shortly before made a beginning and had made great progress. This is a reason why I'm so very anxious that many learned men may become spiritual. I shall speak of this by and by. What I am saying, namely, let them not rise if God does not raise them, is the language of spirituality. He will understand me who has any experience. I know not how to explain it, if what I have said does not make it plain. In mystical theology, of which I spoke before, the understanding ceases from its acts because God suspends it. As I shall explain by and by, if I can, and God give me the grace to do so. We must neither imagine nor think that we can of ourselves bring about this suspension. That is what I say must not be done nor must we allow the understanding to cease from its acts. For in that case, we shall be stupid and cold, and the result will neither be the one nor the other. For when our Lord suspends the understanding and makes it cease from its acts, he puts before it that which astonishes and occupies it, so that without making any reflections, it shall comprehend in a moment more than we could comprehend in many years with all the efforts in the world. To have the powers of the mind occupied, to think that we can keep them at the same time quiet, is folly. I repeat it, though it be not so understood. There is no great humility in this. If it be blameless, it is not left unpunished. It is a labor thrown away, and the soul is a little disgusted. It feels like a man about to take a leap and is held back. Such a one seems to have used up his strength already and finds himself unable to do that which he wished to have done. So here, in the scanty gain that remains, he who will consider the matter will trace that slight want of humility of which I have spoken. For that virtue has this excellence. There is no good work attained by humility that leaves the soul disgusted. 
seems to me that I have made this clear enough. Yet, after all, perhaps only for myself. May our Lord open their eyes who read this by giving them experience, and then however slight that experience may be, they will immediately understand it. For many years I read much and understood nothing. And for a long time, too, though God gave me understanding herein, I never could utter a word by which I might explain it to others. This was no little trouble to me. When His Majesty pleases, He teaches everything in a moment so that I am lost in wonder. One thing I can truly say, though I conversed with many spiritual persons who sought to make me understand what our Lord was giving me in order that I might be able to speak of it, the fact is that my dullness was so great that I derived no advantage whatever, much or little, from their teaching. Or it may be, as His Majesty has always been, my Master. May He be blessed forever. For I am ashamed of myself that I can say so with truth. That it was His good pleasure I should meet with no one to whom I should be indebted in this matter. So, without my wishing or asking it, I never was careful about this, for that would have been a virtue in me, but only about vanity. God gave me to understand with all the distinctness in a moment and also enabled me to express myself so that my confessors were astonished, but I more than they, because I knew my own dullness better. It is not long since this happened, and so that which our Lord has not taught me, I seek not to know it, unless it be a matter that touches my conscience. Again, I repeat my advice. It is of a great moment not to raise our spirit ourselves, if our Lord does not raise it for us. And if he does, there can be no mistaking it. For women, it is especially wrong, because the devil can delude them, though I am certain our Lord will never allow him to hurt anyone who labors to draw near unto God in humility. On the contrary, such a one will derive more profit and advantage out of the attack by which Satan intended to hurt him. I have dwelt so long upon this matter because this way of prayer is the most common with beginners and because the advice I have given is so very important. It will be found much better given elsewhere. And I admit also that in writing it I am ashamed of myself and covered with confusion, though not so much as I ought to be. Bless forever, our Lord, of whose will and pleasure it is that I am allowed, being what I am, to speak of things which are His, of such a nature and so deep. I have thought it right to speak of certain temptations I have observed to which beginners are liable. Some of them I have had myself, and to give some advice about certain things which to me seem necessary. In the beginning, then, we should strive to be cheerful and unconstrained, for there are people who think it is all over with devotion if they relax themselves ever so little. It is right to be afraid of self, so that having no confidence in ourselves, much or little, we may not place ourselves in those circumstances wherein men usually sin against God. For it is most necessary fear, till we become very perfect in virtue. And there are not many who are so perfect as to be able to relax themselves on those occasions which offer temptations to their natural temper. For always, while we live, were it only to preserve humility, it is well we should know our own miserable nature. But there are many occasions on which it is permitted us, as I just said now, to take certain recreation, in order that we may with more vigor resume our prayer. Discretion is necessary throughout. We must have great confidence, because it is very necessary for us not to contract our desires, but put our trust in God. For if we do violence to ourselves, 
little by little, we shall, though not at once, reach that height which many saints by his grace have reached. If they have never resolved to desire, and never by little and little acted upon that resolve, they never could have ascended to so high a state. His Majesty seeks and loves courageous souls, but they must be humble in their ways and have no confidence in themselves. I never saw one of those lag behind on the road and never a cowardly soul, though aided by humility, make that progress in many years which the former makes in a few. I'm astonished at the great things done on this road by encouraging oneself to undertake great things. Though we may not have the strength for them at once, the soul takes a flight upwards and ascends high, though like a little bird whose wings are weak, it grows weary and rests. At one time, I used often to think of those words of St. Paul, that all things are possible in God. I saw clearly that of myself I could do nothing. This was of great service to me. So also was the saying of St. Augustine, Give me, O Lord, what thou commandest, and command what thou wilt. I was often thinking how St. Peter lost nothing by throwing himself into the sea, though he was afterwards afraid. These first resolutions are a great matter, although it is necessary in the beginning that we should be very reserved, controlled by the discretion and authority of a director. But we must take care that he be one who does not teach us to crawl like toads, nor one who may be satisfied when the soul shows itself fit only to catch lizards. Humility must always go before so that we may know that the strength can come out of no strength of our own. But it is necessary we should understand what manner of humility this should be because Satan, I believe, does great harm. For he hinders those who begin to pray from going onwards by suggesting to them false notions of humility. He makes them think it is pride to have large desires, to wish to imitate the saints, and to long for martyrdom. He tells us forthwith, or he makes us think, that the actions of the saints are to be admired, not to be imitated, by us who are sinners. I, too, say the same thing, but we must see what those actions are which we are to admire and what those are which we are to imitate. For it would be wrong in a person who is weak and sickly to undertake much fasting and sharp penances to retire into the desert where he could not sleep nor find anything to eat or indeed to undertake any austerities of this kind. But we ought to think that we can force ourselves, by the grace of God, to hold the world in profound contempt, to make light of honor, and be detached from our possessions. Our hearts, however, are so mean that we think the earth would fail us under our feet if we were to cease to care even for a moment for the body and give ourselves up to spirituality. It is painful to me that our confidence in God is so scanty and our self-love so strong as that any anxiety about our own necessities should disturb us. But so it is. For when our progress is so slight, a mere nothing will give us much trouble as great and important matters will give to others. And we think ourselves spiritual. Now, to me, This way of going on seems to betray a disposition to reconcile soul and body together in order that we may not miss our ease in this world and yet have the fruition of God in the next. And so it will be if we walk according to justice, clinging to virtue. But it is the pace of a hen. It will never bring us to liberty of spirit. It is a course of proceeding, as it seems to me, most excellent for those who are in the married state and who must live according to their vocation. But for the other state, 
I by no means wish for such a method of progress, neither can I be made to believe it to be sound. For I have tried it, and I should have remained in that if our Lord in his goodness had not taught me another and a shorter road. Though in the matter of desires, I always had generous ones. But I labored, as I said before, to make my prayer, and at the same time to live at my ease. If there had been anyone to rouse me to a higher flight, he might have brought me, so that I think, to a state in which these desires might have had their effects. But for our sins, so few and so rare are they whose discretion in that matter is not excessive. That, I believe, is reason enough why those who begin do not attain more quickly to great perfection. For our Lord never fails us, and it is not his fault, the fault and the wretchedness of this being all our own. We may also imitate the saints by striving after solitude and silence and many other virtues that will not kill these wretched bodies of ours, which insist on being treated so orderly that they may disorder the soul. And Satan, too, helps much to make them unmanageable. When he sees us a little anxious about them, he wants nothing more to convince us that our way of life must kill us and destroy our health. Even if we weep, he makes us afraid of blindness. I have passed through this, and therefore I know it. But I know of no better sight or better health that we can desire than the loss of both in such a cause. Being myself so sickly, I was always under constraint, and good for nothing till I resolved to make no account of my body nor of my health. Even now I am worthless enough. But when it pleased God to let me find out this device of Satan, I used to say to the latter, when he suggested to me that I was ruining my health, that my death was of no consequence. When he suggested rest, I replied that I did not want rest, but the cross. His other suggestions I treated in the same way. I saw clearly that in most things, though I was really very sickly, it was either a temptation of Satan or a weakness on my part. My health has been much better since I have ceased to look at my ease and comforts. It is of great importance not to let our own thoughts frighten us in the beginning, when we set ourselves to pray. Believe me in this, for I know it by experience. As a warning to others, it may be that this story of my failures may be useful. There is another temptation which is very common, when people begin to have pleasure in the rest and the fruit of prayer. They will have everybody else be very spiritual also. Now, to desire this is not wrong, but to try to bring it about may not be right, except with great discretion and with much reserve, without any appearance of teaching. He who would do any good in this matter ought to be endowed with solid virtues, that he may not put temptation in the way of others. It happened to me, that is how I know it, when, as I said before, I made others apply themselves to prayer, to be a source of temptation and disorder. For on the one hand, they heard me say great things of the blessedness of prayer, and on the other, saw how poor I was in virtue, notwithstanding my prayer. They had good reasons on their side, and afterwards they told me of it, for they knew not how these things could be compatible one with the other. This it was that made them not regard that as evil which was really so in itself, namely, that they saw me do it myself, now and then during this time that they thought well of me in some measure. This is Satan's work. He seems to take advantage of the virtues we may have for the purpose of giving a sanction, so far as he can, to the evil he aims at. How slight soever that evil may be, his gain must be great, if it prevail in a religious house. 
how much then must his gain have been when the evil I did was so very great? And thus, during many years, only three persons were the better for what I said to them. But now that our Lord has made me stronger in virtue, in the course of two or three years, many persons have profited, as I shall show hereafter. There is another great inconvenience in addition to this, the loss of our own soul. For the utmost we have to do in the beginning is to take care of our own soul only and consider that in the whole world there is only God and our soul. This is a point of great importance. There is another temptation. We ought to be aware of it and be cautious in our conduct. Persons are carried away by a zeal for virtue through the pain which the sight of the sins and failings of others occasions them. Satan tells them that this pain arises only out of their desire that God may not be offended and out of the anxiety about his honor, so they immediately seek to remedy the evil. This so disturbs them that they cannot pray. The greatest evil of all is their thinking this an act of virtue, of perfection, and of a great zeal for God. I'm not speaking of the pain which public sins occasion, if they be habitual in any community, nor of wrongs done to the church, nor of heresies by which so many souls are visibly lost. For this pain is most wholesome, and being wholesome is no source of disquiet. The security thereof of that soul which would apply itself to prayer lies in casting away from itself all anxiety about persons and things, in taking care of itself and in pleasing God. This is the most profitable course. If I were to speak of the mistakes which I have seen people make in reliance on their own good intentions, I should never come to an end. Let us labor, therefore, always to consider the virtues and the good qualities which we discern in others, and with our own great sins cover our eyes, so that we may see none of their failings. This is one way of doing our work, and though we may not be perfect in it at once, we shall acquire one great virtue. We shall look upon all men as better than ourselves, And we begin to acquire that virtue in this way, by the grace of God, which is necessary in all things. For when we have it not, all our endeavors are in vain. And by imploring him to give us this virtue, for he never fails us, if we do what we can. This advice also they must take into their consideration, who make much use of their understanding, eliciting from one subject many thoughts and conceptions. As to those who, like myself, cannot do it, I have no advice to give, except that they are to have patience until our Lord shall send them both matter and light, for they can do so little of themselves that their understanding is a hindrance to them rather than a help. To those, then, who can make use of their understanding, I say that they are not to spend the whole time in that way. For though it be meritorious, yet they must not, when prayer is sweet, suppose that there never will be a Sunday or a time when no work ought to be done. They think it lost time to do otherwise. But I think that loss their greatest gain. Let them rather, as I have said, place themselves in the presence of Christ and, without fatiguing the understanding, converse with him and in him rejoice without wearying themselves in searching out reasons. But let them rather lay their necessities before him and the just reasons there are why he should not suffer us in his presence. At one time this, at another time that, lest the soul should be wearied by always eating of the same food. These meats are most savory and wholesome, if the palate be accustomed to them. They will furnish a great support for the life of the soul, 
and they have many other advantages also. I will explain myself further, for the doctrine of prayer is difficult and without a director very hard to understand. Though I would willingly be concise, and though a mere hint is enough for his clear intellect who has commanded me to write on the subject of prayer, yet so it is, my dullness does not allow me to say or explain in a few words that which is so important to explain well. I, who have gone through so much, am sorry for those who begin only with books, for there is a strange difference between that which we learn by reading and that which we learn by experience. Going back then to what I was saying, we set ourselves to meditate upon some mystery of the Passion. Let us say, our, our Lord at the pillar. The understanding goeth about seeking for the sources of which came that great Dolores and the bitter anguish which His Majesty endured in that desolation. It considers that mystery in many lights, which the intellect, if it be skilled in its work or furnished with learning, may there obtain. This is a method of prayer which should be to everyone the beginning, the middle, and the end, a most excellent and safe way, until our Lord shall guide them to other supernatural ways. I say to all, because there are many souls who make great progress by meditation on other subjects than on the sacred passion, for as there are many mansions in heaven, so there are also many roads leading thither. Some persons advance by considering themselves in hell, others in heaven, and these are distressed by meditations on hell. Others meditate on death. Some persons, if tender-hearted, are greatly fatigued by continual meditations on the Passion, but are consoled and make progress when they meditate on the power and greatness of God in His creatures and on His love visible in all things. This is an admirable method, not omitting, however, from time to time, the passion and life of Christ, the source of all good that ever came and that ever shall come. He who begins is in need of instruction, whereby he may ascertain what profits him most. For this, it is very necessary he should have a director, who ought to be a person of experience, for if he be not, he will make many mistakes and direct a soul without understanding its ways or suffering it to understand them itself. For such a soul, knowing that obedience to a director is highly meritorious, dares not transgress the commandments it receives. I have met with souls cramped and tormented because he who directed them had no experience. That made me sorry for them. Some of them knew not what to do with themselves, for directors who do not understand the spirit of their penitence afflict them soul and body and hinder their progress. One person I had to do with had been kept by her director for eight years, as it were, in prison. He would not allow her to quit the subject of self-knowledge, and yet our Lord had already raised her to the prayer of quiet so she had much to suffer. Although this matter of self-knowledge must never be put aside, but there is no soul so great a giant on this road but has frequent need to turn back and be again an infant at the breast. And this must never be forgotten. I shall repeat it, perhaps many times, because of its great importance. For among all states of prayer, however high they may be, there is not one in which it is not often necessary to go back to the beginning. The knowledge of our sins and of our own selves is the bread which we have to eat with all the meats, however delicate they may be, in the way of prayer. Without this bread, life cannot be sustained, though it must be taken by measure. When a soul beholds itself resigned, and clearly understands that there is no goodness in it, when it feels itself abashed in the presence of so great a king and sees how little it pays of the great debt it owes him, 
Why should it be necessary for it to waste its time on the subject? Why should it not rather proceed to the other matters which our Lord places before it, and for neglecting which there is no reason? His Majesty surely knows better than we do what kind of food is proper for us. So, then it is of great consequence that the director should be prudent, I mean of sound understanding, and a man of experience. If, in addition to this, he is a learned man, it is a very great matter. And if these three qualities cannot be had together, the first two are the most important, because learned men may be found with whom we can communicate when it is necessary. I mean, that for beginners, learned men are of little use if they are not men of prayer. I do not say that they are to have nothing to do with learned men because a spirituality, the foundations of which are not resting on the truth, I would rather were not accompanied with prayer. Learning is a great thing, for it teaches us who know so little and enlightens us. And so when we have to come to the knowledge of the truth contained in the holy writings, we do what we ought to do. From silly devotions, God deliver us. I will explain myself further, for I am meddling, I believe, with too many matters. It has always been my failing that I could never make myself understood, as I said before, but at the cost of many words. A nun begins to practice prayer. If her director be silly, and if he should take it into his head, he will make her feel that it is better for her to obey him than her own superior. He will do all this without any evil purpose, thinking that he is doing right. For if he be not a religious himself, he will think this right enough. If this penitent be a married woman, he will tell her that it is better for her to give herself unto prayer when she ought to attain to her house, although she may thereby displease her husband. And so it is. He knows not how to make arrangements for time and business so that everything may be done as it ought to be done. He has no light himself and can therefore give none to others, however much he may wish to do so. Though learning does not seem necessary for discretion, my opinion has always been, and will be, that every Christian should continue to be guided by a learned director if he can and be more learned the better. They who walk in the way of prayer have the greater need of learning, and the more spiritual they are, the greater is that need. Let them not say that learned men not given to prayer are not fit counselors for those who pray. That is a delusion. I have conversed with many, and now for some years I have sought them the more because of my greater need of them. I have always been fond of them, for though some of them have no experience, they do not dislike spirituality, neither are they ignorant of what it is, because in the sacred writings in which they are familiar, they always find the truth about spirituality. I am certain myself that a person given to prayer, who treats of these matters with learned men, unless he is deceived with his own consent, will never be carried away by any illusions of the devil. I believe that the evil spirits are exceedingly afraid of learned men who are humble and virtuous, knowing that they will be found out and defeated by them. I have said this because there are opinions held to the effect that learned men, if they are not spiritual, are not suited for persons given to prayer. I have just said that a spiritual director is necessary, but if he is not a learned man, he is a great hindrance. It will help us much if we consult those who are learned, provided they be virtuous. Even if they not be spiritual, they will be of service to me, and God will enable them to understand what they should teach. He will even make them spiritual in order that they may help us on. I do not say this without having had experience of it, and I have met with more than two. 
I say then that a person who shall resign his soul to be wholly subject to one director will make a great mistake if he is in religion unless he finds a director of this kind because of the obedience due to his own superior. His director may be deficient in the three requisites I speak of, and that will be no slight cross without voluntarily subjecting the understanding to one whose understanding is none of the best. At least I have never been able to bring myself to do it, neither does it seem to me to be right. But if he be a person living in the world, let him praise God for the power he has of choosing him who will obey, and let him not lose so excellent at liberty. Yea, rather, let him be without a director till he finds him. For our Lord will give him one, if he is really humble and has a desire to meet with the right person. I praise God greatly. We women and those who are unlearned ought always to render him unceasing thanks, because there are persons who, by labor so great, have attained to the truth which we unlearned people are ignorant. I often wonder at learned men, particularly those who are in religion, when I think of the trouble they had at acquiring that which they communicate to me for my good, and that without any more trouble to me than of asking for it. And yet there are people who will not take advantage of their learning. God grant it may not be so. I see them undergo the poverty of the religious life, which is great, together with its penances, its meager food, the yoke of obedience, which makes me ashamed of myself at times. And with all this, interrupted sleep, trials everywhere and elsewhere, the cross. I think it would be a great evil for anyone to lose so great a good by his own fault. It may be some of us who are exempted from these burdens, who have our food put into our mouths, as they say, and live at our ease, may think because we give ourselves a little more to prayer that we are raised by the necessity of such great hardships. Blessed be thou, O Lord, who hast made me so incapable and so useless, but I bless thee still more for this, that thou quickenest so many to quicken us. Our prayer must therefore be very earnest for those who give us light. What should we be without them in the midst of these violent storms which now disturb the church? If some have fallen, the good will shine more and more. May it please our Lord to hold them in his hand and help them that they may help us. I have gone far away from the subject I began to speak of, but all is to the purpose of those who are beginners, that they may begin a journey which is so high in such a way as that they going on by the right road. Coming back then to what I spoke of before, the meditation on Christ bound to the pillar, it is well we should make reflections for a time and consider the sufferings he there endured, for whom he endured them, who he is, who endured them, and the love with which he bore them. But a person should not always fatigue himself in making these reflections but rather let him remain there with Christ in the silence of the understanding. If he is able, let him employ himself in looking upon Christ who is looking upon him. Let him accompany him and make his petitions to him. Let him humble himself and delight himself in Christ and keep in mind that he never deserved to be there. When he shall be able to do this, though it may be in the beginnings of his prayer, he will find great advantage. And this way of prayer brings great advantages with it. 
at least so my soul has found it. I do not know whether I am describing it aright. You, my father, will see to it. May our Lord grant me to please him rightly forever. Amen. Having spoken of the toilsome efforts and of the strength required for watering the garden when we have to draw the water out of the well, let us now speak of the second manner of drawing the water which the Lord of the vineyard has ordained, of the machine of wheel and buckets whereby the gardener may draw more water with less labor and be able to take some rest without being continually at work. This, then, is what I am going to describe, and I apply it to the prayer called the prayer of quiet. Herein the soul begins to be recollected. It is now touching on the supernatural, for it never could by any efforts of its own attain to this. True, it seems at times to have been wearied at the wheel, laboring with the understanding and filling the buckets. But in the second degree, the water is higher, and accordingly, the labor is much less than what it was when the water had to be drawn up out of the well. I mean that the water is nearer to it, for grace reveals itself more distinctly to the soul. This is a gathering together of the faculties of the soul within itself, in order that it may have the fruition of that contentment in greater sweetness. But the faculties are not lost, neither are they asleep. The will alone is occupied in such a way that, without knowing how it became a captive, it gives a simple consent to become the prisoner of God. For it knows well what it is to be the captive of him it loves. O my Jesus and my Lord, how pressing now is thy love! It binds our love in bonds so straightly that it is not in its power at this moment to love anything else but thee. The other two faculties help the will, that it may render itself capable of the fruition of so great a good. Nevertheless, it occasionally happens, even when the will is in union, that they hinder it very much. But then it should never heed them at all, simply a binding in its fruition and quiet. For if it tried to make them recollected, it would miss its way together with them, because they are at this time like doves, which are not satisfied with the food the master of the dovecot gives them without any laboring for it on their part, and which go forth in quest of it elsewhere, and so hardly find it that they come back. And so the memory and the understanding come and go, seeking whether the will is going to give them that into the fruition of which it has entered itself. If it be our Lord's pleasure to throw them any food, they stop. If not, they go again to seek it. They must be thinking that they are of some service to the will, and now and then the memory or the imagination seeking to represent to it that of which it has the fruition, does it harm. The will, therefore, should be careful to deal with them as I shall explain. Everything that takes place now in this state brings the very greatest consolation, and the labor is so slight that prayer, even if persevered in for some time, is never wearisome. The reason is that the understanding is now working very gently, and is drawing very much more water than it drew out of the well. The tears which God now sends flow with joy. Though we feel them, they are not the result of any efforts of our own. This water of grand blessings and graces, which our Lord now supplies, makes the virtues thrive much more, beyond all comparison, than they did in the previous state of prayer for the soul is already ascending out of its wretched state, and some little knowledge of the blissfulness of glory is communicated to it. This, I believe, is it that makes the virtues grow the more, and also to draw nearer to essential virtue, God himself, 
from whom all virtues proceed. For His Majesty has begun to communicate Himself to this soul and will have it feel how He is communicating Himself. As soon as the soul has arrived thus far, it begins to lose the desire of earthly things. And in no wonder, for it sees clearly that, even for a moment, this joy is not to be had on earth. That there are no riches, no dominion, no honors, no delights that can for one instant, even for the twinkling of an eye, minister such a joy. For it is a true satisfaction, and the soul sees that it really does satisfy. Now, we who are on earth, as it seems to me, scarcely ever understand wherein our satisfaction lies, for it is always liable to disappointment. But in this, at that time, there is none. The disappointment cometh afterwards, when the soul sees that all is over, and that it has no power to recover it. Neither does it know how, for if it cut itself in pieces by penance and prayer and every other kind of austerities, all would be of little use if our Lord did not grant it. God, in his great mercy, will have the soul comprehend that his majesty is so near to it that it need not send messengers to him, but may speak to him itself, and not with a loud crying, because so near is he already that he understands even the movements of its lips. It seems absurd to say this, saying that we know that God understands us always and is present with us. It is so, and there can be no doubt of it, but our Emperor and Lord will have us now understand that he understands us, and also have us understand what his presence bringeth about and that he means, in a special way, to begin a work in the soul, which is manifested in the great joy, inward and outward, which he communicates, and in the difference there is, as I said just now, between this joy and delight, and all the joys of earth. For he seems to be filling up the void in our souls, occasioned by our sins. This satisfaction lies in the innermost part of the soul, and the soul knows not whence nor how it came. Very often it knows not what to do, or wish, or pray for. It seems to find all this at once, and knoweth not what it hath found. Nor do I know how to explain it, because learning is necessary for many things. Here, indeed, learning would be very much to the purpose in order to explain the general and practical helps of grace for there are many who know nothing about them. Learning would serve to show how our Lord now will have the soul to see, as it were, with the naked eye, as men speak, this particular help of grace, and be also useful in many other ways wherein I am likely to go astray. But as what I write is to be seen by those who have the learning to discover whether I make mistakes or not, I go on without anxiety. For I know I need have none whatever about either the letter or the spirit, because it is in their power to whom it is to be sent to do with it as they will. They will understand it and blot out whatever may be amiss. I should like them to explain this, because it is a principal point, and because a soul, when our Lord begins to bestow these graces upon it, does not understand them and does not know what to do with itself. For if God leads it by the way of fear, as he led me, its trial will be heavy, if there be no one who understands the state it is in. And to see itself as in a picture is a great comfort, and then it sees clearly that it is traveling on that road. The knowledge of what it has to do is a great blessing for it, so that it may advance forwards in every one of these degrees of prayer. For I have suffered greatly and lost much time because I did not know what to do. And I'm very sorry for the souls who find themselves alone when they come to this state. For though I read many spiritual books wherein this very matter is discussed, 
they drew very little light upon it. And if it be not a soul much exercised in prayer, it will find it enough to understand its state, be the books ever so clear. I wish much that our Lord would help me to describe the effects on the soul of these things now that they begin to be supernatural, so that men might know by these effects whether they come from the Spirit of God. I mean, known as these things are known here below, though it is always well to live in fear and on our guard, for even if they do come from God, now and then the devil will be able to transform himself into the angel of light, and the soul, if not experienced herein, will not understand the matter, and it must have so much experience for the understanding thereof that it is necessary it should have attained to the highest perfection of prayer. The little time I have helps me but little, and it is therefore necessary His Majesty should undertake it himself. For I live in community, and have very many things to employ me, as I am in a house which is newly founded, as will appear hereafter. And so I am writing with very many interruptions, by little and little at a time. I wish I had leisure, for when our Lord gives the Spirit is more easily and better done. It is then, as with person working embroidery with the pattern before her, if the spirit be wanting, there is no more meaning in the words than in gibberish, so to speak, though many years may have been spent in prayer. And thus, I think a very great advantage to be in this state of prayer when I am writing this, for I see clearly that it is not I who speak, nor is it I who with the understanding has arranged it. And afterwards, I do not know how I came to speak so accurately. That has often happened to me thus. Let us now return to our orchard, or flower garden, and behold how the trees begin to fill with sap from the bringing forth of the blossoms, and then of the fruit, the flowers and the plants, also their fragrance. This illustration pleases me for very often when I was beginning, and our Lord grant that I have really begun to serve His Majesty. I mean, begun in relation to what I have to say of my life. It was to me a great joy to consider my soul as a garden, and our Lord as walking in it. I used to beseech him to increase the fragrance of the little flowers of virtue, which were beginning as it seemed to bud, and preserve them, that they might be to his glory, for I desired nothing for myself. I prayed him to cut those he liked, because I already knew that they would grow the better. I say cut, for there are times in which the soul has no recollection of this garden. Everything seems parched, and there is no water to be had for preserving it, and in which it seems as if the soul had never possessed any virtue at all. This is the season of heavy trials. For our Lord will have the poor gardener suppose all the trouble he took in maintaining and watering the garden to have been taken to no purpose. Then is the time really for weeding and routing out every plant, however small it may be, that is worthless, in the knowledge that no efforts of ours are sufficient if God withholds from us the waters of his grace, and in despising ourselves as being nothing and even less than nothing. In this way, we gain great humility. The flowers grow afresh. Oh, my Lord and my good, I cannot utter these words without tears and rejoicing in my soul, for thou wilt be thus with us and art with us in the sacrament. We may believe so most truly, for so it is, and the comparison I make is a great truth. And if our sins stand not in the way, we may rejoice in thee, because thou rejoicest in us. For thou hast told us that thy delight is to be with the children of men. Oh, my Lord, what does it mean? Whenever I hear these words, they always give me great consolation, and did so even when I was most wicked. 
It is possible, Lord, that there can be a soul which, after attaining to the state wherein thou bestowest upon it the like graces and consolations, and wherein it understands that thou delightest to be with it, can yet fall back and defend thee after so many favors and such great demonstrations of the love thou bearest it, and of which there cannot be any doubt because the effect of it is so visible. Such a soul there certainly is, for I have done so, not once, but often. May it please thy goodness, O Lord, that I may be alone in my ingratitude, the only one who has committed so great an iniquity and whose ingratitude has been so immeasurable. But even out of my ingratitude, thine infinite goodness has brought forth some good, and the greater my wickedness, the greater the splendor of thy great mercy of thy compassions. Oh, what reasons have I to magnify them forever? May it be so, I beseech thee, O oh my God, and may I sing for them forever, now that thou hast been pleased to show mercy so great unto me that they who see them are astonished. Mercies which draw me out of myself continually, that I may praise thee more and more. For, remaining in myself, without thee, I could do nothing. O oh my Lord, but be as the withered flowers of the garden, so that this miserable earth of mine becomes a heap of refuse, as it was before. Let it not be so, O Lord. Let not a soul which thou hast purchased with so many labors be lost, one which thou hast so often ransomed anew and delivered from between the teeth of the hideous dragon. You, my Father, must forgive me for wandering from the subject, and as I am speaking to the purpose I have in view, you must not be surprised. What I write is what my soul has understood, and it is very often hard enough to abstain from the praises of God when, in the course of writing, the great debt I owe him presents itself before me. Nor do I think that it can be disagreeable to you, because both of us, I believe, may sing the same song, though in a different way. For my debt is much the greater, seeing that God has forgiven me more, as you, my father, know. Now, let us go back to the subject. This quiet and recollection of the soul makes itself in great measure felt in the satisfaction and peace attended with very great joy and repose of the faculties and most sweet delight, wherein the soul is established. It thinks, because it has not gone beyond it, that there is nothing further to wish for, but that its abode might be there, and it would willingly say so with St. Peter. It dares not move nor stir, because it thinks that this blessing it has received must then escape out of its hands. Now and then it could wish it did not even breathe. The poor little soul is not aware that, as of itself, it could do nothing to draw down this blessing on itself. It is still less able to retain it a moment longer than our Lord's wills it should remain. I have already said that in the prior recollection and quiet, and there is no failure of the powers of the soul. But the soul is so satisfied in God that, although two of its powers be distracted, Yet, while the recollection lasts, as the will abides in union with God, so its peace and quiet are not disturbed. On the contrary, the will by degrees brings the understanding and the memory back again. For though the will is not yet altogether absorbed, it continues still occupied without knowing how, so that notwithstanding all the efforts of the memory and the understanding, they cannot rob it of its delight and joy. Yea, rather it helps without any labor at all to keep this little spark of the love of God from being quenched. Oh, that His Majesty would be gracious unto me and enable me to give a clear account of the matter. 
for many are the souls who attain this state, and few are they who go farther. I know not who is in fault. Most certainly it is not God. For when His Majesty shows mercy unto a soul so that it advances so far, I believe that He will not fail to be more merciful still if there be no shortcomings on our part. And it is of great importance for the soul that has advanced so far as this, to understand the great dignity of its state, the great grace given it by our Lord, and how in all reason it should not belong to earth, because he, of his goodness, seems to make it here a denzian of heaven, unless it be itself in fault. And miserable will that soul be if it turns back. It will go down, I think so, even to the abyss, as I was going myself, if the mercy of our Lord had not brought me back. Because, for the most part, it must be the effect of grave faults. That is my opinion, nor is it possible to forsake so great a good otherwise than through the blindness occasioned by much evil. Therefore, for the love of our Lord, I implore those souls to whom His Majesty has given so great a grace, the attainment of this state, to know and make much of themselves with a humble and holy presumption, in order that they may never return to the flesh pots of Egypt. And if through weakness and wickedness and a mean and wretched nature they should fall, as I did, let them always keep in mind the good they have lost. Let them suspect and fear they have reason to do so, that if they do not resume their prayer, they may go on from bad to worse. I call that a real fall, which makes us hate the way by which so great a good was obtained. I address myself to those souls, but I am not saying that they will never offend God, nor fall into sin, though there are good reasons why those who have received these graces should keep themselves carefully from sin. But we are miserable creatures. What I earnestly advise is this. Let there be no giving up of prayer. It is by prayer they will understand what they are doing and obtain from our Lord the grace to repent and strength to rise again. They must believe and believe again that if they cease from praying, they run, so I think, into danger. I know not if I understand what I am saying, for as I said before, I measure others by myself. The prayer of quiet, then, is a little spark of the true love of himself, which our Lord begins to enkindle in the soul. And his will is that the soul should understand what this love is by the joy it brings. This quiet and recollection and little spark, if it is the work of the Spirit of God, and not a sweetness supplied by Satan or brought about by ourselves, produces great results. A person of experience, however, cannot possibly fail to understand at once that it is not a thing that can be acquired, were it not that our nature is so greedy of sweetness that it seeks for it in every way. But it comes cold very soon, for however much we try to make the fire burn, in order to obtain this sweetness, it does not appear that we do anything but throw water on it to put it out. This spark, then, given of God, however slight it may be, causes a great crackling, and if men do not quench it by their faults, it is the beginning of the great fire which sends forth, I shall speak of it in the proper place, the flames of the most vehement love of God which His Majesty will perfect souls to possess. This little spark is a sign or a pledge which God gives to a soul, in token of his having chosen it for great things, if it will prepare to receive them. It is a great gift, much too great for me to be able to speak of it. It is a great sorrow to me, because, as I said before, I know that many souls come thus far, and that those who go farther, as they ought to go, 
are so few that I am ashamed to say it. I do not mean that they are absolutely few. There must be many, because God is patient with us for some reason. I speak of what I've seen. I should like much to recommend these souls to take care of that they do not hide their talent, for it may be that God has chosen them to be the edification of many others, especially in these days when the friends of God should be strong, in order that they may support the weak. Thus, those who discern in themselves this grace must look upon themselves as such friends if they would fulfill the law which even the honorable friendship of the world respects. If not, as I said just now, let them fear and tremble, lest they should be doing mischief to themselves, and grant it be to themselves only. What the soul has to do at those seasons wherein it is raised to the prayer of quiet is nothing more than to be gentle and without noise. By noise, I mean going about with the understanding and search of words and reflections whereby to give God thanks for this grace and heaping up its sins and imperfections together to show that it does not deserve it. All this commotion takes place now and the understanding comes forward and the memory is restless and certainly to me these powers bring much weariness at times. For though my memory is not strong, I cannot control it. Let the will quietly and wisely understand that it is not by dint of labor on our part that we can converse to any good purpose with God and that our own efforts are only great logs of wood laid on without discretion to quench this little spark. And let it confess this and in humility say, O Lord, what can I do here? What has the servant to do with her Lord and earth with heaven? Or words of love that suggest themselves now, firmly grounded in the conviction that what it says is truth. And let it make no account of the understanding, which is simply tiresome. And if the will wishes to communicate to the understanding, any portion of that fruition of which itself has entered on, or if it labors to make the understanding recollected, it shall not succeed, for it will often happen that the will is in union and at rest, while the understanding is in extreme disorder. It is better for it to leave it alone and not to run after it. I'm speaking of the will, for the will should abide in the fruition of that grace, recollected itself like the prudent bee. For if no bees entered the hive, and each of them wandered abroad in search of the rest, the honey would hardly be made. In the same way, the soul will lose much if it be not careful now, especially if the understanding be acute. For when it begins to make reflections and search for reasons, it will think at once that it is doing something if its reasons and reflections are good. The only reason that ought to be admitted now is to understand clearly that there is no reason whatever except his mere goodness why God should grant us so great a grace and to be aware that we are so near him and to pray to his majesty for mercies, to make intercession for the church for those who had been recommended to us and for the souls in purgatory. Not, however, with the noise of words, but with a heartfelt desire to be heard. This is a prayer that contains much, and by it more is obtained than by many reflections of the understanding. Let the will stir up some of those reasons which proceed from reason itself to quicken its love, such as that fact of its being in a better state, and let it make certain acts of love as what it will do for him to whom it owes so much, and that, as I said just now, 
without any noise of the understanding, in the search after profound reflections. A little straw, and it will be less than straw, if we bring it ourselves, laid on with humility, will be more effectual here and will help to kindle a fire more than many faggots of most learned reasons, which, in my opinion, will put it out in a moment. This is good for those learned men who have commanded me to write, and who all, by the goodness of God, have come to this state, for it may be that they spend the time in making applications of passages of the scriptures, and though learning could not fail to be of great use to them, both before and after prayer. Still, in the very time of prayer itself, there is little necessity for it, in my opinion, unless it be for the purpose of making the will tepid. For the understanding, then, because of its nearness to the light, is itself illuminated, so that even I, who am what I am, seem to be a different person. And so it is. For it has happened to me, scarcely understand a word of what I read in Latin and especially in the Psalms, when in prayer of quiet, not only to understand the Latin as if it were Spanish, but still more to delight in dwelling on the meaning of that I knew through the Spanish. We must make an exception. If these learned men have to preach or to teach, they will do well to take advantage of their learning, that they may help poor people of little learning, of whom I am one. Charity is a great thing, and so always is ministering unto souls when done simply for God. So then, when the soul is in the prayer of quiet, let it repose in its rest. Let learning be put on one side. The time will come when they may make use of it in the service of our Lord, when they that possess it will appreciate it so highly as to be glad they had not neglected it even for all the treasures of the world, simply because it enables them to serve his majesty, for it is a great help. But in the eyes of infinite wisdom, believe me, a little striving after humility and a single act thereof are worth more than all the science in the world. This is not the time for discussing but for understanding plainly what we are and presenting ourselves in simplicity before God, who will have the soul make itself as a fool, as indeed it is, in his presence, seeing that his majesty so humbles himself as to suffer it to be near him, we being what we are. Moreover, the understanding bestirs itself to make its thanksgivings in phrases well arranged, but the will, in peace, not daring to lift up its eyes with the publican, makes perhaps a better act of thanksgiving than the understanding, with all the tropes of its rhetoric. In a word, mental prayer is not to be abandoned altogether now, nor even vocal prayer, if at any time we wish or can to make use of either of them. For if the state of quiet be profound, it becomes difficult to speak, and it can be done only with great pain. I believe myself that we know whether this proceeds from the Spirit of God or is brought about by endeavors of our own in the commencement of devotion which God gives. And we seek of ourselves, as I said before, to pass onwards to this quiet of the will. Then no effect whatever is produced. It is quickly over, and the aridity is the result. If it comes from Satan, the practiced soul, in my opinion, will detect it, because it leaves trouble behind, and scant humility, and poor dispositions for those effects which are wrought if it comes from God. It leaves neither light in the understanding, nor a steadiness in the truth. Here Satan can do little or no harm if the soul directs unto God the joy and sweetness it then feels. And if it fixes the thoughts and desires on him, according to the advice already given, the devil can gain nothing whatever. On the contrary, by the permission of God, he will lose much by that very joy which he causes in the soul, because the joy will help the soul, 
inasmuch as it thinks the joy comes from God, to betake itself often to prayer in its desire for it. And if the soul is humble, indifferent to, and detached from all joy, however spiritual, and if it loves the cross, it will make no account of the sweetness which Satan sends. But it cannot so deal with that which comes from the Spirit of God. Of that it will make much. Now, when Satan sends it, as he is nothing but a lie, and when he sees that the soul humbles itself through that joy and sweetness, and here in all things relating to prayer and sweetness, we must be very careful to endeavor to make ourselves humble. Satan will not often repeat his work when he sees that he loses by it. For this and for many other reasons, when I was speaking of the first degree of prayer and of the first method of drawing the water, I insisted upon it that the great affair of souls is, when they begin to pray, to begin also to detach themselves from every kind of joy and to enter on it resolved only on helping to carry the cross of Christ like good soldiers, willing to serve their king without present pay, because they are sure of it at last, having their eyes directed to the true and everlasting kingdom at the conquest of which we are aiming. It is a very great matter to have this always before our eyes, especially in the beginning. Afterwards, it becomes so clear that it is rather a matter of necessity to forget it in order to live on. Now, laboring to keep in mind that all things here below are of short duration, that they are all nothing, that the rest we have here is to be accounted as none, all this, I say, seems to be exceedingly low, and so indeed it is, because those who have gone on to greater perfection would look upon it as a reproach and be ashamed of themselves if they thought that they were giving up the goods of this world because they are perishable, or that they would not be glad to give them up for God, even if they were to last forever. The greater the perfection of these persons, the greater their joy, and the greater also would that joy be if the duration of these worldly goods were greater. In these persons thus far advanced, love is already grown, and love is that which does this work. But as to beginners, to them it is of the utmost importance and they must not regard this consideration as unbecoming, for the blessings to be gained are great, and that is why I recommend it so much to them, for they will have need of it. Even those who have attained to great heights of prayer at certain times when God will try them and when His Majesty seems to have forsaken them. I have said as much already, and I would not have it forgotten. In this our life on earth, the growth of the soul is not like that of the body. We, however, so speak of it, and in truth it does grow. A youth that is grown up, whose body is formed, and who has become a man, does not ungrow, nor does his body lessen in size. But as to the soul, it is so by our Lord's will, so far as I have seen it in my own experience, but I know nothing of it in any other way. It must be in order to humble us of our greater good and to keep us from being careless during our exile, seeing that he who has ascended the higher has the more reason to be afraid and to be less confident in himself. A time may come when they whose will is so wrapped up in the will of God and who, rather than fall into a single imperfection, would undergo torture and suffer a thousand deaths, will find it necessary, if they would be delivered from offending God and from the commission of sin, to make use of the first armor of prayer, to call to mind how everything is coming to an end and that there is a heaven and a hell, and to make use of other reflections of that nature 
when they find themselves assailed by temptations and persecutions. Let us go back to what I was saying. The great source of our deliverance from the cunning devices and the sweetnesses which Satan sends is to begin with a resolution to walk in the way of the cross from the very first and not to desire any sweetness at all, seeing that our Lord himself has pointed out has pointed out to us the way of perfection, saying, Take up thy cross and follow me. He is our example, and whosoever follows his counsel only to please him has nothing to fear. In the improvement which they detect in themselves, they who do so will see that this is no work of Satan, and if they fall, they have a sign of the presence of our Lord, and they're rising again at once. They have other signs also, of which I'm going to speak. When it is the work of the Spirit of God, there is no necessity for going about searching for reasons on the strength of which we may elicit acts of humility and of shame, because our Lord himself supplies them in a way very different from that by which we could acquire them by our own poor reflections, which are nothing in comparison with that real humility arising out of the light which our Lord here gives us, which begets a confusion of faith that undoes us. The knowledge with which God supplies us, in order that we may know that of ourselves we have no good in us, is perfectly apprehended, and the more perfectly the greater the graces. It fills us with a great desire of advancing in prayer and never of giving it up, whatever troubles may arise. The soul offers to suffer everything. A certain security, joined with humility and fear concerning our salvation, casts out servile fear at once from the soul and in its place plants a loyal fear of more perfect growth. There is a visible beginning of a love of God utterly divested of all self-interest together with a longing after seasons of solitude in order to obtain a great fruition of this good. In short, not to worry myself, it is the beginning of all good. The flowers have so thriven that they are at a point of budding and the soul sees most clearly, and it is impossible to persuade it now that God was not with it, till it turns back upon itself and beholds its own failings and imperfections. Then it, fear, then it fears for everything, and it is well it should do so, though there are souls whom the certain conviction that God is with them benefits more than all the fear they may ever have if a soul love greatly and is thankfully natural, the remembrance of the mercies of God makes it turn to him more effectually than all the chastisements of hell it can ever picture to itself. At least it was with me, though I am so wicked. As I shall speak at greater length of the signs of a good spirit, it has cost me much labor to be clear about them. I do not treat of them here. I believe, too, that with the help of God, I shall be able to speak somewhat to the point, because, setting aside the experience I have had, and by which I learned much, I have had the help of some most learned men and persons of great holiness, whom we may reasonably believe in the matter. Souls, therefore, are not to weary themselves so much as I did when, by the goodness of our Lord, they may have come to this state. Let us now speak of the third water wherewith this garden is watered, water running from a river or from a brook, whereby the garden is watered with very much less trouble, although there is some in directing the water. In this state, our Lord will help the gardener, and in such a way as to be, as it were, the gardener himself. 
doing all the work. It is the sleep of the powers of the soul, which are not wholly lost, nor yet understanding how they are at work. The pleasure and sweetness and delight are incomparably greater than in the former state of prayer. And the reason is that the waters of grace have risen up to the neck of the soil, so that it can neither advance nor retreat, nor does it know how to do so. It seeks only the fruition of exceeding bliss. It is like a dying man with a candle in his hand. On the point of dying, the death is desired. It is rejoicing in this agony with unutterable joy. To me, it seems to be nothing else but a death, as it were, to all the things of this world and a fruition of God. I know of no other words whereby to describe it or to explain it. Neither does the soul then know what to do. For it knows not whether to speak or to be silent, whether it should laugh or weep. It is a glorious folly, a heavenly madness, wherein true wisdom is acquired, and to the soul a kind of fruition most full of delight. It is now some five or six years, I believe, since our Lord had raised me to this state of prayer in its fullness, and that more than once. And I never understood it, never could explain it, and so I was resolved when I should come thus far in my story to say very little or nothing at all. I knew well enough that it was not altogether the union of all the faculties, and yet most certainly it was higher than the previous state of prayer. But I confess that I could not determine and understand the difference. The humility of your reverence, willing to be helped by a simplicity so great as mine, has been the cause, I believe, why our Lord, today, after communion, admitted me to this state of prayer, without the prayer of going further, and suggested to me these comparisons, and taught me how to speak of it, and of what the soul must do therein. Certainly, I was amazed, and in a moment understood it all. I have often been thus, as it were, beside myself, drunk with love, and yet never could understand how it was. I knew well that it was the work of God, but I never was able to understand the manner of his working here, for in fact the faculties are almost all completely in union, yet not so absorbed that they do not act. I have been singularly delighted in that I have been able to comprehend the matter at last. Let's be our Lord, who has thus consoled me. The faculties of the soul now retain only the power of occupying themselves wholly with God. Not one of them ventures to stir. Neither can we move one of them without making great efforts to distract ourselves. And indeed, I do not think we can do it at all at this time. Many words are then uttered in praise of God, but disorderly, unless it be that our Lord orders them himself. At least, the understanding is utterly powerless here. The soul longs to send forth words of praise, but it has no control over itself. It is in a state of sweet restlessness. The flowers are already opening. They are beginning to send forth their fragrance. The soul in this state would have all men behold and know of its bliss to the praise of God and help it to praise Him. It would have them to be partakers of his joy, for his joy is greater than it can bear. It seems to me that it is like the women in the gospel who would, and used to, call in her neighbors. The admiral spirit of David, the royal prophet, must have felt it the same way, so it seems to me, when he played on the harp, singing the praises of God. I have a great devotion to this glorious king. I wish all had it, particularly those who are sinners, like myself. Oh my God, what must that soul be when it is in this state? It wishes it were all tongue, in order that it may praise our Lord. 
It utters a thousand holy follies, striving continually to please him by whom it thus possessed. I know one who, though she was no poet, yet composed without any preparation certain stanzas full of feeling, most expressive of her pain. They were not the work of her own understanding, but in order to have a great fruition of that bliss which so sweet a pain occasioned her, she complained of it in that way to God. She was willing to be cut in pieces, soul and body, to show the delight she felt in that pain. To what torments could she be then exposed that would not be delicious to endure for her Lord? She sees clearly that the martyrs did little or nothing so far as they were concerned when they endured their tortures because the soul is well aware that its strength is derived from another source. But what will be its sufferings when it returns to the use of the senses to live in the world and go back to the anxieties and the fashions thereof? I do not think that I have exaggerated in any way, but rather have fallen short in speaking of that joy which our Lord, of his good pleasure, gives to the soul in this its exile. Blessed forever be thou, O Lord, and may all created things praise thee forever. O my King, seeing that I am now, while writing this, still under the power of this heavenly madness, an effect of thy mercy and goodness, and it is a mercy I never deserved, grant, I beseech thee, that all those with whom I have to converse may become mad through thy love, and let me converse with none, or so order it, that I may have nothing to do in the world, or take me away from it. This, thy servant, O oh my God, is no longer able to endure suffering so great as those are which she must bear when she sees herself without thee, if she must live. She seeks no repose in this life, and do thou give her none. This my soul longs to be free. Eating is killing it, and sleep is wearisome. It sees itself wasting the time of this day in comforts, and that there is no comfort for it now but in thee. It seems to be living contrary to nature, for now it desires to live not in itself, but in thee. O oh, my true Lord and my happiness, what a cross hast thou prepared for those who attain to this state? Light and most heavy at the same time, Light, because sweet. Heavy, because now and then there is no patience left to endure it. And yet the soul never wishes to be delivered from it, unless it be that it may come to thee. When the soul remembers that it has never served thee at all, and that by living on it may do thee some service, it longs for a still heavier cross, and never to die before the end of the world. Its own repose it counts as nothing in comparison with doing a slight service to thee. It knows not what to desire, but it clearly understands that it desires nothing else but thee. O oh, my son, so humble is he to whom this writing is directed, and who has commanded me to write, that he suffers himself to be thus addressed. You, my father, only must see these things, in which I seem to have transgressed all bounds. For no reason can keep me reasonable when our Lord draws me out of myself. Since my communion this morning, I do not believe that I am the person who is speaking. I seem to be dreaming the things I see. I wish I might never see any but people ill as I am now. I beseech you, my Father, let us all be mad, for the love of him who for our sakes suffered men to say of him that he was mad. You, my father, say that you wish me well. I wish you would prove it by disposing yourself so that God may bestow this grace upon you. For I see very few people who have not too much sense for everything they have to do. 
and it may be that I have more than anybody else. Your reverence must not allow it. You are my father, for you are my confessor, and the person to whom I have trusted my soul. Disperse my delusions by telling the truth, for truths of this sort are very rarely told. I wish we five, who now love one another in our Lord, had made some such arrangement as this, as others in these times have met together in secret to plot wickedness and heresies against His Majesty. So we might contrive to meet together now and then in order to undeceive one another, to tell each wherein we might improve ourselves and be more pleasing unto God. For there is no one that knows himself as well as he is known of others who see him, if it be with eyes of love and the wish to do him good. I say in secret, for language of this kind is no longer in use. Even preachers go about arranging their sermons as to displease no one. They have good intention, and the work is good, yet still few amend their lives. But how is it that they are not many who, in consequence of these sermons, abstain from public sins? Well, I think it is because their preachers are highly sensible men. They are not burning with the great fire of the love of God, as the apostles were, casting worldly prudence aside, and so their fire throws out but little heat. I do not say that their fire ought to burn like that of the apostles, but I do wish it were stronger fire than I see it is. Do you, my father, know wherein much of this fire consists? In the hatred of this life, in the desertion of its honors, in being utterly indifferent whether we lose or gain anything or everything, provided the truth be told and maintained for the glory of God. For he who is courageously earnest for God looks upon loss or gain indifferently. I do not say that I am a person of this kind, but I wish I was. Oh, grand freedom, to regard it as a captivity to be obliged to live and converse with men according to the laws of the world. It is the gift of our Lord. There is not a slave who would not imperil everything that he might escape and return to his country. And as this is the true road, there is no reason why we should linger, for we shall never effectually gain a treasure so great so long as this life is not ended. May our Lord give us his grace for that end. You, my Father, if it shall seem good to you, will tear up what I have written and consider it as a letter for yourself alone. And forgive me that I have been very bold.